So my world is, uh, I am an education technologist and I work between those two worlds. Every year I have a, an organisation called the Mind Lab, some of you may have heard of it around the country. We teach 40,000 kids a year, so pretty, you know, lots of interface with young, young children. We also teach teachers about technology and we all, I also have an organisation called Tech Futures Lab, which is about actually preparing businesses for the future. So a similar type of uh, role is what Roger does. But I want to talk about these three areas here because they're ones that are perhaps not talked about as much and they're not necessarily technologies. The first is, right now we look at the world in terms of all the innovation that's been happening. If you look at where it started and the scaling and when the real exponential growth happened was around 10 years ago when we started having really easy access to the internet, where Wi-Fi became the norm, speeds increased. So while we had lots of technologies that set you know, two decades ago were developed like the likes of VR or autonomous vehicles or 3D printing, about 10 years ago we could suddenly find each other because the world became a much smaller place. But what's interesting about the smaller place is less than half the world are actually online. And so all of this development has happened within the Western world and the developed world. But actually if you look and follow what's happening in terms of the companies out there who are trying to bring free or very low cost fast internet to the rest of the world, people like Facebook and Google and Microsoft and SpaceX and you know, there's, there's actually 12 major organisations are saying within 24 months the rest of the world will be covered. So what happens if you go forward 24 months and suddenly 4.2 billion more people come online? What kind of levels of innovation will we see there when they're not held back by legacy and old institutionalised thinking? They haven't invested in huge infrastructure which they have to justify for education. They can self-educate and learn and connect and find people and talk to experts. So we're going to have a very different world that your competitors in terms of your peers are going to come from the rest of the world as much as from the developed world. And very seldomly do you have that conversation with anyone. Um, at the same time, the world population is growing. So since 1999, we've got another billion people in this world. Now, that may not sound like a lot to you as young, if you're young, but when I was young, and I'm talking in primary school young, there were only 3.5 billion people in the world. So 3.5 has grown now to 7.5, and I'm not that old. If you go back in the history of man, actually, if you go way back, it, it's, it was very, very slow growth for many years and then the exponential tipping point. And we expect it to grow to, it, by 2050 to around 10 billion people. So we're going to have a lot more people to feed, to provide energy for, to nourish, to educate. The good thing is technology is going to be the saviour, I think, in this case. Um, I believe every business and every organisation these days has to think of themselves as a technology company. Because if you can't scale, if you can't connect, if you cannot reach, then you can't have impact. So while you can do great small projects locally, you can't make major impact projects without using technology to get out there. And that doesn't matter if you're a, a primary industry or whether you are a manufacturer or you're a health practitioner, you have to be able to reach the people at the other end. Um, automation, we've, we've talked a little bit about this morning, but I think it needs to be talked about in not just the terms of you know, we talk about things like autonomous vehicles and robotics and processes becoming faster because of higher computing capacity. Actually, there's a lot of roles that are actually going to become completely obsolete because of big data. The idea that you can run information in real time and have it spit out information, it means roles like accountants, it means roles like GPs and diagnostics, it means roles like lawyers, all become under threat because actually they are data-driven organisations. So once you can put in a system where you can process that information really rapidly, you can take away the need for a person to find that information. And so I increasingly working with those traditional sectors saying, what is the role they play in the future if it's not about finding case law or not about finding a solution to this person in front of them with a health condition? So we've got two ends of the spectrum. The developing world are, are, are more under threat because a lot of the roles that they perform in the current world is very simplistic roles and so automation comes a real issue straight away because you can actually, the return on investment on a automated system or a robotic system is normally within two years. So they can actually replace people and they work 24 hours a day and they don't have unions and they don't stop for cigarette breaks and everything else. So you've got one aspect. In the developed world, our costs of wages are very high. 
So actually putting in automation instead of a person actually is it's a big driver. So we've got two ends of the spectrum that people are motivated in different ways to provide less people for the same jobs. And I think that's the interesting thing. So you do an overlay. You say the world is growing, the population is expanding. We have two big groups. We have a very big group over 65 in the developed world. New Zealand is definitely that group. And we have an extraordinary large group coming through under 20s in the developing world. And that's the Middle East through Latin America, it's through Asia. So they are, and those are the people who are going to be self-educated, online, connected, looking for ways to change the world. And at the same time, we're going to have Le the need for less people to do jobs. So if you put those three things together, you start saying, what is work for? So why do we work? Why do we work 40 hours a week? If the, if the idea of working 40 hours a week is to, to buy us more time to do things we want to do, what if you could do that without working 40 hours a week? You'd learn es less money, but maybe you will gain more free time. You know, so we have to start balancing where did that industrial model of 40 hours a week mean that we've shaped our entire world that way. So I think we definitely, as young people, we have to all think about how do we work, why do we work, and what are we going to do with that time when we're at work. That's it from me. Thank you.